about uh, big data, um, distributed system theories, properties, and all the tricks you should know to avoid all the marketing bullshit. Yeah. So let's start. Um, my name is Yui Haiduan. So I'm working as a technical advocate for DataStax. Um, DataStax, we are a company uh, distributing an enterprise version of Apache Cassandra. So you have the open source and then you have the enterprise edition. Who is familiar with Apache Cassandra here? Please raise your hand, okay, some of you. I am working so uh, also on open source projects like Achilles, which is an object mapper uh, for Cassandra, Apache Zeppelin, I am a committer for Apache Zeppelin, which is a notebook for big data projects. You can ping me on my Twitter or write me an email if you have any questions about Zeppelin or Cassandra. So this is the agenda for this morning. I will start by introducing all the theories and properties about distributed system. Then I will talk about data sharding replication, the CAP theorem, and we will finish by comparing the two major architectures in distributed system, which is master-slave and masterless. So let's talk about the theory. First, when you deal with distri distributed system, you need to know about time. There is no absolute time in theory even if you have atomic clocks, right? Uh, so the time, time, you cannot avoid the time drift. You know that Google, they have atomic clocks on each server with GPS, and even with this hardware, which is very expensive, they still have a bound of 20 to 30 mill milliseconds of time drift. So it, it is impossible to have exact absolute time everywhere on Earth. So the solution is NTP, Network Time Protocol. This is, there is a daemon which should be installed on every machine. We are in 2017, so every Linux machine has an NTP daemon. It's not sufficient to install it. You need also to configure it properly, correctly, to avoid a too big time drift. Okay, since there is no absolute time, can we talk about the ordering of operations. For example, I have two transactions. How can I know that one transaction happened before or after another one? Especially when my clock is not 100% reliable. And especially if my transaction can happen on multiple machines, which can be apart by thousands of kilometers. One machine in New York and one machine in London, for example. So ordering of operation is hard. But you can have a local or relative ordering if you stick to a single machine. You can say, on this single machine, I can guarantee that all the operation which happen on this machine can be ordered locally. This is possible. But for global ordering, it is very hard. Not to say impossible in theory. Unless, unless you have a perfectly synchronized time, which is not possible, or unless you have a global lock. That is the only solution. So, to provide some kind of relative or partial ordering, in the literature we have some known algorithms. The first one, Lamport clock, it's very simple. Every time a sender sends a message, it just increments the time and send the timestamp with the message. From the receiver side, it will just take the timestamp provided by the sender and take the max of its own timestamp plus one. So it means that from the receiver side, the timestamp is always bigger than from any sender. So with this very simple algorithm, we can provide a partial ordering between a pair of sender receiver. 
but we cannot guarantee a global ordering. There is another algorithm, vector clock, where every time you have some events, see, you assign an event some kind of logical time. And then you send, every time you send a message, you send also the state, so the event C, A, B, with their respective logical time. So on the receiver side, there will be some merging. If, and if you have a conflict, thanks to the logical time, you can know that there is a conflict. But vector clock does not help you to solve the conflict. Vector clock algorithm will help you to, to tell, oh, I know that there is a conflict, but I don't know how to solve it. So it depends on you, developer. Now let's talk about latency. The latency, the definition of latency is the time interval between the moment you send the request and the moment you receive the response, right? So the latency can be composed of first network delay by router, by switch, OS delay, which can be negligible, and also the time to process your request. For example, if you have a disk access, you need to compute some value, it takes time. So by speed of light physics, the maximum speed in the void is 300,000 kilometers per second. But since we are using fiber optics ca cables, the maximum speed you can get on Earth in fiber optics is 197,000 kilometers per second. So it means that if I have a ping between London and New York, it will take minimum minimum 56 milliseconds. You can never go below that value. Right. Speed of light physics. So now let me ask you a question. When you are reading some marketing document and some database vendor tell you the, the average latency is below 10 milliseconds, is it true or is it false? Who do you think, who thinks it is true? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's wrong? Raise your hand. Well, the answer is it can be true and wrong. Why? Because if I measure the latency right, if I connect my, uh, my measure right just next to the machine, yeah, you can have 10 milliseconds latency. But if I measure the time from, for example, one continent apart, is it wrong? So it depends on where you measure your latency. There is no absolute answer for this question. So w when someone tells you this, you should ask him, how do you measure your latency? Right. We talk about time, ordering, latency. Let's talk about failure. In distributed system, we have some categories of failure. So you have Byzantine failure. It means that your application doesn't behave correctly and you have bugs. So you send a request and the value you receive is incorrect. You can have performance failure. In the sense that the response arrives too late. Omission failure is a special case of performance failure. In this case, the response doesn't arrive at all. So you reach a timeout. And of course you have a crash failure where the server serving the request just crash. So in fact, there are only two meaningful failure. One about the value. The request fails because the value is incorrect. And you have timing failure. The request does not, the response does not arrive in a timely manner. So the general the, cause, the root causes of failure can be, first, you can have a hardware issue, you can have a software issue. It can be also workload specific. Imagine that you are flushing a huge files on a SAN, like a network drive. And uh, at the same time, there are lots of other application using the same drive. So you will have huge latency. Or the failure can be JVM related. So if you are working with Java technology, you know that 
there is some garbage collection. And sometimes you can have 10 seconds, 20 seconds, even one minute garbage collection, yes, because the, the JVM is poorly configured. So in this case, your server doesn't respond during one minute. So from the point of view of the client, the server fails. Right? So in fact, defining failure is quite hard because you don't know the exact cause of your failure. In the case of JVM, long GC pause. Well, after 10 seconds, the server will reply again. Right? But in, in the case of hardware crash, well, the server will not reply anymore even if you try again and again. So defining failure is hard. And a common definition for failure is if I send a request and I don't receive an answer in a timely manner, I can consider that my server fails. Now how to detect failure? We have some algorithms. The, the most simple one is the heartbeat, right? You ping a server, it doesn't reply, you say that it is dead. But this algorithm is too simple because, for example, in the case of JVM pause, uh, GC pause, you ping the server when the server is having like three seconds garbage connection, it doesn't reply, but it doesn't mean that the server has died. Right? So there are some other algorithms, for example, exponential backoff. I ping one time, I don't get the, the reply, so I wait for, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, I ping another time, I wait again longer and longer. Or there are some other very involved, complex algorithm based on statistics, free acro detector. Right. Now, we said that time is unreli not reliable. The global ordering is very hard to achieve and failure is hard to detect. So in a distributed system, how can different machines agree on a single value? That is the big question. So to, to answer this question, we have some important property. First, if you have to create an algorithm to agree on a single value in distributed system, this algorithm should validate the validity property, which is all the, the um, sum of the machines should propose a valid value. Termination means, of course, that the consensus protocol finish at some time and will not enter in an infinite loop. And agreement means that all the processes should agree on the same value. So I should not be able to to fall in a situation where somebody proposed value A and someone else proposed value B. The proposed value should be the same. So we have some consensus protocols. So originally we have two-phase commits, right? The problem with two-phase commits is if the coordinator fails, the master of the protocol fails, the protocol is blocked forever so the termination property is not satisfied. Satisfy. Then people propose three phases commit to add an extra phase, but still it's not working in distributed system because if you have a network partition, so there is an election of a new coordinator, you, when the, the partition is resolved, you can have an inconsistent state. So it means that you can have two propo different proposed values and the agreement properties is not met. And finally, we have some very well-known protocols in this repetitive system, Paxos, RAF, and ZAP, used by Zookeeper. So those three protocols all satisfy the three requirements and they are based on a quorum, which means that they require that a strict majority of machines to be alive in order to finish. If you have more than the majority of your machine who are offline, 
the protocol will never finish or will fail. So this is the first part, introduce, introducing some theories behind distributed system. Do you have any questions so far? No. So now let's talk about sharding and replication. Why do we need to shard data? Because of scalability. If you have multiple machines and you need to store more and more data, you need to share the data between those machines. So you need to have some algorithm to, to distribute the data. That's what we call sharding. And the sharding also help you to simplify the problem using the divide and conquer strategy. Each shard can be viewed as a, a small uh, the DB, the database, in a small, smaller scale. Right? If you can solve the problem at a single shard, you may be able to solve the problem at the whole scale. So how to shard? Either you can provide an user-defined algorithm. So the user, the developer, choose the sharding algorithm and the target columns on which you apply your sharding algorithm. The second choice is the database choose a fixed algorithm for sharding, and the developer only choose the column on which to apply this algorithm. So let's take an example. If I have an user table, and my sharding key is user ID, and I choose a sharding algorithm MD5, right, to take a hash of my user ID, well, I may have a balanced distribution of my data. Imagine that I have five shards from 0 to 100, right? 0, 19, 20, 39, and so on. So I will have a pretty balanced distribution of my users across the five shards. But if I'm not very clever, I say, OK, let's take the email as a sharding key. And the sharding algorithm is, oh, I take the first letter of each email. So we have this shard, A to C. All the emails are rest. starting from A to C will go into this shard. Starting from E to H will go to this shard. And we can see that the shards are not at all balanced because people whose email address starting with Y to Z, there are very few data here. So th yes, this is a stupid example. But to show you that is it really important to think about the distribution of your shell. Now, if we talk about fixed sharding algorithm, for example, Murmur tree, Murmur tree is a hash function whose property is to distribute very well the data. So you can choose any sharding key. The algorithm will guarantee you a very even distribution of your data. So after saying that, someone will tell you, with Marmotry, we are guaranteed to have an even distribution of my data. Is it true or is it wrong? Wrong? Why? OK, so the first answer here is wrong, because if we have specific data, the algorithm will not work. So yeah, kind of. Any other answer? No? So in fact, the idea is, let me give you an example, a simple example. Let's play a game. So this is wrong, yeah, the right answer. You know this game, right? You were a kid, you, we were rolling dice. So if you roll the dice 100 times, this is the distribution, right? You don't have an uniform distribution of each number. If you roll the dice 1,000 times, it's better. If you roll the dice 1 million times, it's better and better. Right? So what it means here is if you have very few data, very few distinct value of your sharding key, there is no guarantee that the hash function will provide you an even distribution. But if you have 1 million user ID, 10 million user ID, you will have a good distribution. So it's all about statistics. Right? 
be careful. With, even with the best sharding algorithm in the world, if you don't have enough data, you will have this kind of school distribution. So this is about sharding. Now the trade-off of sharding. So if you shard by manually shard and you choose a bad sharding key, you will have hotspot and imbalance, right? Uh, some, in some case, when you choose your sharding to be to allow range query, for example, in my um, user email, I decided that each shard represent the first letter of my email address. Of course, it is not well balanced, but it allows range query, right? So I can say, give me all the email address starting from A to C because my sharding respect the ordering of my sharding key. So I can have range query. But if you choose a hash-based sharding, of course you will have uniform distribution if you have a lot of values, distinct value. But now the range query is no longer possible because the hash will lose the ordering of your sharding key. Right? So I can no longer perform this query the only possible query is a point query. Give me some value where the sharding key value is equal to some. Right. Okay. So this is the trade-off. Depending on which sharding algorithm you choose, you have this trade-off. Now imagine that for some category of NoSQL solution, range query is mandatory. So especially, for example, key value database. Because in the case of key value database, the structure is very simple. I have a key, I have a value. So I can ask, give me the value if I give you a key. But it is too simple. So sometimes they extend the feature to say, this is a range of key, give me all the possible values. So in this case, they need ordering. But if you introduce ordering in your sharding, you will have hotspot, remember. So. To solve this hotspot problem, there is a process which is called rebalance. So sometimes, automatically, the database will say, okay, this shard has too much data, and this one has too few data, so I need to copy, to move my data from one shard to another one. So sometimes it is automated process, sometimes it is manual, but in any case, it is a resource intensive process because you need to read data, so use CPU, memory, and disk right? on production traffic, of course. So, in a nutshell about sharding, depending on the chosen algorithm, you should know all the trade off and the consequence. So the consequence of ordering with sharding is rebalance is necessary. Now let's talk about data replication. So we know how to distribute our data on all the machines. Now how to replicate our data? Because if you don't replicate your data and you lose one shard, you lose some data, right? So it is mandatory to replicate your data by having multiple copies. So there are two types of replicas. And very few people talk about this. You have symmetric replicas and you have asymmetric replicas. A symmetric replica is what? Is maybe I have three copies and all of them are equal. An asymmetric replica is I have some primary or what I call master replica and some slave replica. So all the operation, read and write, should go through a single server, the master replica first, and then go to the slave replica after. And the definition of replica is sometimes different. In a symmetric replica system, one replica is one copy. So if I, you have three replicas, you have three copies in total. In a master-slave architecture, the total number of copies is the master plus the number of replicas, which is equivalent to the number of slaves. So let's see how it works. In a symmetric replica system, when you write, the client, you just dispatch parallel write to all the replica.
because there is no wrong. They are all equal. And when you are reading, you can read from any replica because there is no master. No primary, no secondary. You can read from any replica. With the asymmetric replica system, the write always go to the master first or the primary replica or call what? Call it whatever you want. That's the same idea. To the primary replica and then after that, the primary replica will dispatch, will validate your write and will dispatch to all other replicas. And for the read operation, it's the same thing. The master can contact one, two, or all three replicas before replying to the client. So it means that in this case, your master here is a bottleneck for this shard, right? So to avoid this kind of bottleneck, sometimes people say, okay, you can change a configuration value to allow the client to read directly from the value from the replica without going through the master. Why should I go through the master for reading? I can just read directly my value from one of the replica. But be careful. You may lose consistency. So let me show you some failure scenario. We talked about failure before, right? So first scenario, the master send the write request to a replica, but because of some network issue, the replica never received the write request. So it will never acknowledge the master. The write is KO. Okay. The replica can receive the write request, but can drop the write because it is overloaded. So it is a KO. Fine. The third scenario is the replica just crashed right away after receiving the write request, but before sending the acknowledgement. KO. Now there are some tricky, those scenarios are very classic. But there are some tricky ones that few people think about. So imagine your replica received the right request, save it to disk, reply to the master, but the acknowledgement is lost in the network. So from the master point of view, the write is KO, but still your replica has the, the good value, right? So now, if your client is going to read directly from this replica, you have an inconsistency problem. The master say, the write is KO, but when I read, I see the value. Right? It's incorrect. What scenario? The replica crashes after sending the acknowledgement, but before flushing the data to disk. In some technology, to have good performance and low latency, uh, the replica just store the value in memory and not on disk. And then after some time, flushes the value to disk. So imagine that the replica received the value, put it in memory, say OK to the master, but right after that, the replica crashes. So the value is lost forever. And in this scenario too, the, the master knows, received the acknowledgement, so he said, okay, my right is acknowledged, but in fact, the value is lost. Any questions so far about data replication? And KO is uh, knockout. Yeah, KO is not okay. <laughs> Very simple. So this scenario, when you when you look at um, distributed system and NoSQL database, you should think about those scenario. What happened if blah blah blah? What happened if I lose an acknowledgement? And in any case, the vendor should tell you what happened. What are the warranties they provide? Because you can have inconsistency right in those scenarios. Now let's talk about the CAP theorem. So the CAP theorem, I will not go into the details of this because many people already talk about the CAP theorem. So just, I will just give a summary. So it was a conjecture by Brewer, which is formalized later in a paper. 
So the capture M state that any network shared data system, which means any distributed system, can have at most two of these three properties. Consistency, which is equivalent to have a single up-to-date copy of the data. High availability of that data for updates. And tolerance to network partition, CAP. So usually people write this kind of triangle, availability, consistency, partition tolerance, and try to, to sort all the nodes, NoSQL database, on this side or this side or this side. But in reality, it is much more complicated than you think. First, you cannot choose not to be partition tolerant if you are in a distributed system because network failures will happen always. So in the, in the absence of partition, you can choose to be consistent and available. But when partition occur, you should back off to either C or A, but not both, right? So in fact, in reality, those, all of those technology try to provide all three properties, but in different circumstances. If I don't have network partition, I can be consistent and available. If I have network partition, I can choose to stay consistent but lose availability, or lose consistency and provide availability. It's the same thing for those families of database. I can have availability and partition tolerance, and I can increase my consistency but lose the availability. So it's all about choice. So that we call tunable consistency. And what is consistency? It's really tricky to define consistency because in the literature of computer science, you have a lot of different consistency models, like read and committed, read committed, cost of stability, and so on. All the consistency in green here does not do not require coordination. And all those in red require some coordination. So what I mean by coordination is consensus. Remember the three consensus protocol I showed you earlier, Paxos, Rust, and Zap. So if someone, if some database vendor tell you, oh, we provide repeatable read or snapshot isolation, it means that they should use either Paxos or RAF or Zookeeper to provide the coordination necessary for this consistency level. And if they don't use one of those three algorithms, it means that there's something green, there's something wrong with their marketing. So let's take an example. Some consistent database, so claim to be CP, but in fact, after analysis, they do not provide any of the consistency model they claim to provide. They provide only read, uncommitted, and monotonic, 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 monotonic price, sorry. Now, for example, I can talk about Cassandra because I know Cassandra very well. In Cassandra, when you use an operation with consistency level one, you are here, loosely consistent. It doesn't require any coordination, so no backstores, no RAF, anything. If you choose your consistency level to be equal to quorum, you are here. Read your own right or read any right after your own right. And if you want some stronger consistency, which is right linearizability, you can use lightweight transaction. But in then, because it is in the red part of my diagram, it requires some coordination. And what is the coordination? What is the protocol used? to provide this consistency level, this is back source. Any questions so far about consistency? No. Now let's talk about availability. What is availability? 
it means that does it mean you are available to for read in the case of failure or to for write in the original paper availability is only for updates so for write they did not say anything about reading let's take a real world example some marketing message Cassandra claimed to be highly available is it true and even some marketing slides they claim to be continuously available 100% of time is it true so let's see this is a cluster of Cassandra you have some machines and you have three copies of your data here one two three you have a network partition and you are reading your client is connecting from this side of the network partition if you use consistency level one of course you can reach one copy of your data so you still have high availability if you use consistency level quorum which means that you need at least a majority of your copies well it is not possible from this side but this is an optimistic scenario now let's be pessimistic imagine that all of your three copies remains on the same partition side and your client is reading from this side even with consistency level one it will fail because you don't have any copy of your data here so when people say that Cassandra is highly available is it really true in all cases no but there is one scenario you can be highly available this is when you have multiple data center and that's the only scenario because when you have a network partition here and your client try to read the value here and there's no copy your client the driver can just read forward the request to another data center where you don't have network partition and then continue to serve your read this is the only scenario where you can have continuous availability so the continuous availability claim in the marketing message of Cassandra it is not because of the catering see it is not because that Cassandra is an AP system it is because you have multiple data centers so be careful with marketing if you have a single data center you will never have continuous availability any question for this part for the CAT theorem okay so let's finish with the architecture the last part master slave and masterless so pure master slave is very simple you have a single server for all the writes in your system and the read can be done on a master only or any slave and then you lose consistency the advantage of this solution is all the operation can be serialized and order remember about my global ordering I thought in the first part of my presentation so global ordering is possible if you have a single master of course it is easy to reason about because all of your problem is a single machine problem because all of your requests always goes through a single machine you can also perform pre-aggregation what do I mean by pre-aggregation for example you can pre-compute the average value the sum the mean the max and so on on the master the drawback is of course you cannot scale on write read can be scaled if you accept to lose some consistency and of course you have a single point of failure so this is the diagram of a master slave classical architecture now to avoid this single point of failure people say okay now let's use sharding so we have a, now a multi master slave architecture the idea is instead of have a single big master I share my data and on each shell I have a master or a primary replica call it whatever you want but it's the same idea so in each shell 
I still have the same master slave architecture, but from different charm, I don't have any master, right? Now, this is better because if I lose one charm or this master, my database can work with all the charm. So it will not block all operations. And the idea is now I divide my, my, my data into different shells to avoid a single bottleneck. And so the question I ask people, so what happens if I lose a master or a primary rep replica in one shell? They say, no, no problem. It's not a problem. Why? Because it takes less than 10 milliseconds to elect a new uh, a slave into a new master. So, okay, you have 10 milliseconds of downtime. But it's okay. On a single charm, it's okay. But in fact, this is ro the wrong question. The true question is, how long does it take to detect that the master of the shard is offline? Remember, when I talk about failure detection, it's not easy in distributed system. If you use a simple heartbeat system, it's too simplistic. And if your master has a long GC pose, you will declare it offline and you will elect a new master? No. If you are using heartbeat, you will spend your time electing master everywhere. So usually, in the multi-master architecture, to detect that a master of a shard is offline, people use some timeout value. And the problem is the timeout can be in tens of seconds. So it means that you cannot write during this timeout to detect that a master is dead. So the correct value is not that it takes 10 milliseconds to elect a new master, but it takes 10 seconds to detect that the master is down. The advantage of the multi-master slave architecture is the operation can still be ordered in a single chart. So from a single chart point of view, I can order all of my operation. It's still easy to reason about in a single chart. No more big single point of failure. The drawback is now you, the, your consistency is only inside a single chart. So you, know, you can no longer have a global ordering. And you cannot have a transaction that spans different shards. We have also another type of architecture I call fake masterless or share noting architecture. On, in fact, in reality, it is a multi master architecture, but they are branded as share noting masterless architecture. So let me show you. I have seen some online database in their documentation. They say that they have a share noting architecture. This is me, right, on Twitter. They say that they, they are truly masterless. And in the same documentation, you see master not election. What's going on here? You said you are masterless, but you have a master not election. So they, oh yeah, this is a mistake on my documentation. Let me change it. So this was in December 2000, last year, right, 2016. I checked the documentation later in this month. So the official doc say that they are masterless, okay. Fine, no master. And then I download the technical overview paper. And this is what happened in the technical overview paper, writing data. The operation is routed to the primary shard for execution. So your write go to the primary shard. The the operation get executed on a primary shard. If the operation succeeds on a primary shard, the operation get executed on all replicas in parallel. So what does it mean here? Remember that. This is your primary shard. This is your replica shard. It's the same thing. It's a multi-master architecture. But the doc says master masterless. So be careful of marketing, right? You should always ask the details of the technical implementation. How is the right 
dispatch to all the replicas. And whenever you see channel thing must direct or primary shop, mm, be careful. Now let's talk about masterless architecture. So in the masterless architecture landscape, there is no master. So every node has an equal role. But now you have big problem. How to manage consistency if there is no master? Which re replica, which copy of my data has the right value? Right. So to solve this inconsistency issue, there are some data structures to help vector clocks, CRDT, convergent data replicated data types. In a masterless architecture, we have also the notion of coordinator. Because the client will send a write request to a node, this node call is called coordinator. It will just act as a network proxy to dispatch the data to the correct copies because of the sharding algorithm. So now my objection is, what if this machine goes offline? We might have a downtime. Well, not necessary because anyone in the cluster can be coordinator. So in fact, all the machines are completely symmetry. They are equal. So you can choose anyone to contact to be a coordinator. So even the, if this machine goes offline, you don't care. You can still continue to write. And of course, the first write it ha has failed because this machine goes down. But the next write will succeed if you choose another machine. Now, how to solve inconsistency problem? You have CRDT, I mentioned before. So React, which is a NoSQL database, they implement CRDT with counter, with set, with maps, with register. Cassandra only proposed last right wind register based on timestamp. So when you hear based on timestamp, you should say, be careful. Because timestamp is not reliable. So some people ask me, why does, why didn't Cassandra choose to implement CRDT? Because in fact, CRDT is really not intuitive. So conflict, when you have a conflict with CRDT, in some scenario, the developer have to solve the conflict itself. So this is the user responsibility. Who is familiar with CRDT here? Raise your hand. So one, two. The problem is, if you need to know CRDT in order to use Cassandra, it is a big blocker. Right. So that's why we choose a simpler algorithm which is based on timestamp. And we know that timestamp is not reliable. So this is an example. The, the resolution, the conflict resolution in Cassandra is last right win. It means that I write a value A, I write a new value B, the latest value is the correct value based on timestamp. But I can have issue with that. So I have an update here. I set my age to 32 on my user ID 1. My update request will reach the coordinator. Local time of the coordinator is 10 o'clock, 1 second, 50 millisecond. So each replica has the same timestamp. Now I have another update to increment the age to 33. But now the, my coordinator is this machine and the local time is different because I have some time drift. So the local time is in the past 20. So now I write a new value, but the timestamp is in the past. So when you read, you do a select on the edge, Cassandra will return you the old value because of the time drift. Yes, this is possible. So how can you solve this issue? Well, it's functionally rare because 
an update on the same column by different client at almost the same time is quite rare. You can force the timestamp at the client side, but you only move the time synchronization from the server back to the client. You can always use lightweight transaction to have a strong coordinated consistency level with Paxos. So to sum up, masterless architecture, advantage is no single point of failure, but you have, it's very hard to reason about. It requires you to understand some of the distributed system theory and trade off. Any question? My time is off. Yeah, we have time for a couple questions and then we go to lunch. So questions? What do you do generally when you detect uh, breakup? Do you have the feeling from masters of pushing in the flow? Or can, you, can, can you speak louder and repeat? Oh, yeah. um, what do you do after you identified a break? A partition? Yeah. Uh, what do I do if I am... I, uh, I don't take decide. the break. Uh, it is inconsistent yeah. in a shard. In a master slave or master less? In both cases. So the inconsistency in master-slave scenario, usually the master will see that uh, the data from different replica are not consistent. So it will take, the, the, um, in a master-slave architecture, the master is the source of truth. So the master always, always wins, even if you have different value on the slave, the value on the master is the right value. So there is no question, right? If it sees that there is a different value, it will say, hey, slave, Take my value, this is the correct value. In a masterless architecture, that is more complicated. So as I can say, you can use timestamp, but in some case, if you have time drift, it is not completely 100% reliable. So you have to design uh, your application to take into account this kind of scenario. because of the timestamp, you don't know. In fact, you say, okay, how can I know that this value is the correct one because the time is different between two machines. So it's really hard with masterless. Or you can use the golden hammer, lightweight transaction, but it is extremely expensive for network round trip to do just an update, just an update, just an update, just an update. Just an update.